explain about the Snowflake architecture. Snowflake is a cloud data warehouse built on top of Amazon Web Services, which is AWS's cloud infrastructure and is a true SaaS offering. SaaS here is software as a service, which means there is no hardware, either virtual or physical, for us to select, install, configure, or manage, which is obviously the definition of software as a service offering. There is no software for us to install, configure, or manage. All you have to do is just log in and start using Snowflake, which means all ongoing maintenance, management, and tuning is handled by Snowflake itself. From the architecture point of view, there are three main components that make up the Snowflake data warehouse. As you could see, there is a storage layer to start with, compute or query processing layer, and then the cloud service layer. Let's talk about the storage layer. Snowflake relies on scalable cloud blob storage available in clouds like Amazon Web Services, Azure, and GCP. Relying on massively distributed storage systems enables Snowflake to provide a high degree of performance, reliability, availability, capacity, and scalability required by the most demanding of the data repository or data warehousing workloads. Now, there were a lot of words which I called out, which is reliability, meaning having that peace of mind that your data is available and you can read it at any time. Availability means that it's available all the time. There is no downtimes. There is no checking if the server is up and running or not. Capacity comes with the storage, which means you can have any number of millions of records which will store within that system. And obviously scalability, and that's one of the reasons why we go for a SaaS offering and all these cloud-specific solutions, which is to scale. Meaning now from a capacity point of view, let's say you're processing about 50 million records per annum. And in the future, let's say it increases to 80 million records. The system will automatically scale. And obviously you'll be charged for that, which is another whole different discussion, but it is scalable. It's not like you have to provision and procure new hardware for that additional 30 million records for next year. It's there. If that additional 30 million comes in tomorrow, it's ready. So Snowflake organizes the data into multiple micro partitions that are internally optimized and compressed. It uses a columnar format to store that data. Now, where is all this data stored? It is stored in the cloud storage and works as a shared disk model, which provides the simplicity in data management. Now, this way of storing it in multiple micro partitions, which is optimized and compressed, makes sure users do not have to worry about data distribution across multiple nodes in the shared nothing model. In other words, this means that however the backend method is used to distribute, compress, and whatever methods are used to store the data, the users do not have to worry about how that is stored or in what way that is compressed. They can just write a query and they can pull that information. So the storage layer of Snowflake is architected to support the scaling of storage independent to the compute layer. So here, this is created or architected to support the scaling of storage independent of the compute layer. What is compute layer? We'll talk about that in detail, but in a single line, it is nothing but your query processing layer means whenever you write a query, select statement with whatever joins you want, that is what will connect to that storage layer, pull that information, right? So the architecture is built in such a way that the storage layer does not have to spend any of its resources for the compute layer. So this design choice works out great for the end users, which is the persons who are using to write queries in terms of both performance and also the costing method around it. So the storage layer holds the data, tables, and query results for everything which is stored in Snowflake. 
Now, if you notice, we are talking about the virtual warehouses or the query processing layer. So the compute nodes connect with the storage layer to fetch the data for query processing. Now, as this storage layer is independent, we only pay for the average monthly storage used. Of course, we have to refer back to Snowflake's pricing methods around it. But at the time of the recording of this, we only pay for the average monthly storage used. Since Snowflake is provisioned on the cloud, storage is elastic and it is charged as per the usage per terabyte every month. That's about the storage layer. We'll talk about the compute layer and also how that brings in the data and how it moves it to the above layer, which is the cloud services layer. Let's talk about the compute layer or the query processing layer. Snowflake relies on the standard computing infrastructure, which is nothing but the virtual machines available to anyone in a public cloud environment. For example, in AWS, it is the EC2 instances and in GCP, it is the compute engines. So the virtual warehouses, which you see as part of the compute layer, form a critical component in the Snowflake architecture. These virtual warehouses by design can process massive volumes of data with a high degree of efficiency and performance. For example, let's say when the Snowflake's compute layer detects an incoming query, the computer power becomes available immediately to process the request. Snowflake deploys multiple virtual warehouses to process a request, which simultaneously maintaining the integrity of the transaction and also making the system ACID compliant. So based on the need, multiple virtual warehouses can be created in Snowflake for various requirements depending on the workloads. Each virtual warehouse can work with one storage layer. Well, generally a virtual warehouse has its own independent compute cluster and doesn't interact with other virtual warehouses. So what are the advantages of having these virtual warehouses? These virtual warehouses can be started or stopped at any time and also can be scaled at any time without impacting queries that are already running, which is a huge benefit because let's say you execute a query now and you realize that it needs more compute power and it's already been processed like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. You don't want to stop it now, increase the compute power and then start over again. While the query is running, you can increase the capacity so that it can pick it up and process it. And the virtual warehouses also can be set up to auto suspend or auto resume. Auto suspend could be for any reasons where, let's say you don't want it to run for more than 30 minutes, for example. Auto resume can be, let's say after 2 p.m. you want to auto resume that. With this auto suspend or auto resume, the warehouses can be, or the queries can be suspended after a specific period of inactive time. And then when a query is submitted or resumed. So they can also be set to auto scale with minimum and maximum cluster size. So for example, we can set minimum one and maximum three, depending on the load snowflake and provision between one to three multi-cluster warehouses. Each virtual warehouse is packed with compute resources such as CPU, memory, and temporary storage required to perform the SQL and data manipulation operations. Users can retrieve rows from tables, load data into tables, unload data from tables, and regular operations like delete, update, or insert separate rows in tables. So, as I called out, virtual warehouses come in multiple sizes and each increase in size to the next larger warehouse doubles the computing power. Now, since these warehouses don't share computing resources with one another, meaning the compute resource of this virtual warehouse is used within this, it cannot share it with the next one or vice versa. Since it cannot do that, there is no impact on the performance of other machine if one goes down, for example. Now, nodes do not store any data as we spoke about that earlier in the storage layer. So losing them isn't critical because all the data is stored in your storage layer. In any case, if failures occur, 
Snowflake will create a new instance quickly, sometimes in minutes. All right, so that's a brief about the virtual warehouse or the compute layer as part of the Snowflake architecture. Last but not the least, or the most important layer within the Snowflake architecture is the cloud services layer. The services layer of Snowflake is where all the intelligent action happens. This layer performs various functions like authenticating users, management of the cluster, query execution and optimization, security, encryption, and the orchestration of transaction execution. This layer runs on compute nodes that are stateless and span the entire data center. Intelligent use of metadata distributed across the cluster of computing nodes maintains the global state of transactions and the system. Now, when a query is issued, the service layer parses the query, compiles it, and determines which set of partitions hold the data of interest and flags them for scanning. Once the data of interest is flagged for scanning, we usually expect that the data would take quite a lot of time, of course, based on the volumes. However, by design, the processing of the data or metadata happens on a separate cluster of machines, which reduce the impact of the actual compute resources processing the data for the user. We'll get into more details about these layers as we go ahead and talk about different other questions. But for now, understand that the storage layer is where the data is stored. Here you have two options. One is a share everything or share nothing option. Based on that, your compute layer or virtual warehouses will process the queries or the data manipulation language or DMLs accordingly. And the cloud services layer does your authentication, optimizing the queries, metadata management, transaction security, etc. at the cloud service layer. Right. So that's the brief of the Snowflake architecture.